again for being about 25 minutes late. Today's press conference is live on radio and on the internet and also live on TV. We are live on Weasel TV, live on TV XYZ, live on Pan-African TV, live on GH1 and CTV. We are also live on Loud Silence Radio. Radio Gold 90.5, Power FM 97.9 FM, Accra FM 100.5 FM, Aboto 92.3 FM, Think News Online.com, also on our NDC Communication Bureau, we are live on it. I will invite the General Secretary who is coming to brief us about some deep things on the heart of NDC. Without much ado, I'll call on our General Secretary, Honorable Johnson, as you do in Ketia. Good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, let me once again welcome uh, members of the NK fraternity and thank you very much for your prompt response to our invitation as usual. Today's press conference is different from what uh, we did last week. Last week, our focus was on um, the NDC as a party. Today, our focus is on governance and the judiciary. And um, certain developments within the judiciary, which we think if not checked, can pose a grave danger to our democracy and our national stability. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Democratic Congress has carefully considered certain recent developments within Ghana's judiciary and is gravely concerned that if immediate steps are not taken to meet these negative developments in the bar, they will fester with serious harmful effects on the public confidence in our judiciary and by extension in, our, in the democracy of our country as a whole. Our decision to publicly address these concerns has not been taken lightly. We are aware of the auspicious and critical role of our, the, our judiciary plays in our democracy. The sometimes lonely and solitary lives of our judges, their traditional reserve and no comment policy on certain matters of national importance. These attributes of our judges require that we exercise great restraint in our public comments on the judiciary. We are, however, convinced that constructive criticism of our judiciary, particularly the apex court, is a national duty. And as the largest opposition party in Ghana, we will be remiss in our duties to the nation and the people of Ghana if we remain silent in the face of these developments. Accordingly, our duty to our national constitution and obedience to our national motto, freedom and justice, compels us to speak up. Ladies and gentlemen, the NDC 
as of them that our democracy cannot operate efficiently and deliver the values of freedom, justice, development, and equality of opportunity for all citizens, regardless of political affiliation, if our judiciary, particularly elements within the Supreme Court, become or are perceived to be the rented agents or the political wing of a political party. In recent times, certain happenings at the apex court in particular have dampened our faith in the court. And it was for this loss of faith that has provoked our petition to the General Secretary of the Commonwealth of Nations regarding various acts of human rights violations criminal persecutions and harassment of the members and supporters of NDC by the government of Ghana, headed by His Excellency President Nana Abidankwa Akufu Abe. Some of these developments are hereby enumerated. Number one, no reasons assigned for judgments and rulings. One disappointing, if not scandalous development that is likely to make our justice system the part of jokes among other democracies in Africa and the world at large is the phenomenon of court judgments without reasons. In recent times, our Supreme Court has handed down some judgments and rulings that do not make any legal or factual sense because the court has failed to assign any reason for these judgments. Two examples will suffice. It is instructive to note that in the recent case of Abdul Malik Wakuba versus the Attorney General. Suit number J1 stroke 225 stroke 2018, which had raised certain important constitutional questions about the impeachment proceedings of Mrs. Charlotte Osei, the chairperson, the then chairperson of the Electoral Commission. The apex court simply declared, without any reason, that, quote, after listening to counsel in the matter on the question whether the instant action is a proper invocation of our original jurisdiction, and also having regard to the processes filed in this matter, we are of the view that the action does not raise any issue of interpretation or enforcement. Accordingly, we strike out the action, which, in our view, is unmeritorious. Without that, before you come to such a conclusion, you document the reasoning that went into this decision, so that by so doing, you will be developing the law. And then the judgment becomes a precedent based upon which other cases can be considered in future. But just this conclusion and the matter was closed. This cryptic judgment fails in many respects to meet the basic standards of a reasons reason judgment. It is devoid of analysis of the facts of the case. The case and argument presented by the parties, the legal principles upon which the judgment is based, and how those legal principles apply or do not apply to the facts of this case. As to be expected, this judgment cannot form the basis of any legal precedent, suggesting that it was a judgment of convenience 
fashion out solely to deny justice to Mrs. Charlotte Osei. And whilst its immediate intended purpose has been achieved, the judgment ceases to have any legal re relevance in subsequent cases. True to form, the Apex Court again applied this scandalous technique in the case of the Public versus High Court Criminal Division, Accra, ex party Stephen Kwabra Upuni, and Arno, Civil Motion J5, Stroke 15, Stroke 22. The justice hearing the criminal case involving Dr. Stephen Kwabra Upuni. His Lordship Justice Clements Jackson Onyenuga had, in a recent ruling on an application to recuse himself on grounds of real likelihood of bias, accused Dr. Kwabra Okuni of hallucinating malicious lies engineered to cut public support. In this ruling on this matter, the Apex Court stated that, quote, it is our considered opinion that the record does not reflect a personal interest by the trial judge in the matters in issue and the making of discriminatory orders to warrant the grant of an order of sexual to quash the proceedings and orders of the trial court dated 16 December 2021, period. Regarding the application for prohibition, we have thoroughly examined the processes filed by the parties and do not find the existence of a real likelihood of bias on the part of the trial judge, such as will prevent the conduct of a fair trial by the judge. Accordingly, we dismiss the application in its entirety. We are interested in the reasoning that went into this conclusion, and yet it existed only in the minds of the judges. When they die, nobody can quote anything from them or learn anything from the president. This ruling is also devoid of the factual metrics of the case. The case and arguments presented by the parties, the legal principles upon which the judgment is based, and how those legal principles apply or do not apply to the facts of the case. The NDC notes that the phenomenon of unreasoned court judgment has become so commonplace in cases with high political stakes. The NDC wonders how the apex court could engender public confidence in the administrative of justice and remain accountable to the people when it assumed a calculated posture of rendering unreasoned judgment. The NDC believes that unreasoned judgments violate fundamental principles of justice and fair trial. And we wonder whether this phenomenon of unreasoned judgment is a clear manifestation of the relation of judicial duties because it is a fundamental principle that when matters are brought before your lordships, before you come to a conclusion, you must put down black and white how you apply the law, how the cases were argued, and how the facts of the cases comply with the principles of the law or do not comply with the principles of the law. 
So it the matter is brought to you, and all that you have to say is that we have considered this thing in our head, and we believe that you are guilty, or you are not guilty. How are we supposed to learn from the wisdom you applied in arriving at the judgment? How are we supposed to learn from the application of the principles you apply at arriving at this judgment? How are we supposed to evaluate the arguments for and against the positions that are contained in the case which led to the, uh, you arriving at a certain conclusion? I think that it is their duty to give us reasons for their judgments so that those of us who are mortals, we can also follow those reasoning and to find out whether those judgments make sense or they do not make sense. Now, apart from unreasoned judgments, another area which is of great concern is the attempt by the judiciary to trespass into domains reserved for the legislature. You know when we talk about um, separation of powers and checks and balances, it implies that each state institution, each of the three state institutions, have powers reserved for them. And it will be dangerous in any democracy when one or two of the state institutions are on a collusion course with another. And that is why it makes a lot of wisdom for each state institution to apply forbearance in undertaking their duties. So if you know that there's an area reserved for the judiciary, it will be in the interest of parliament not to veer into that. If parliament knows that there is an area which is reserved for the executive, it makes a lot of wisdom and for the preservation of our democracy that parliament will be careful in their attempts to veer into the domain of the executive. In the same way, when the judiciary is presented with a situation where in exercising certain powers, they will appear to be veering in the exclusive domain of the legislature or the executive, they must tread cautiously. Because if each of the three institutions decide to stick to their, uh, I mean, they decide to exercise their full powers, there will be confrontation between the three institutions instead of collaboration and then it will lead to the breakdown of our democracy. And that is why we are worried if we see that there are attempts by the judiciary to invade domains that are traditionally reserved for the legislature. The NDC is also greatly concerned about the unholy haste of the apex court in trespassing into domains reserved for the legislature by the 1992 constitution. We note that one entrenched principle of our legal governance since 1993 has been the recognition by our courts that it is not their business to get into certain matters that by law have been assigned to other branches of government. Contrary to this, principle, we have observed a creeping tendency of the apex court to trespass 
into domains reserved for parliament. In the process, the court has demonstrated legal or constitutional hubris and thrown overboard the restraints the court has exercised in the past over matters that fall within the domain of the parliament of the Republic of Ghana. And as I have said, we find this to be very dangerous development because if parliament also decides to exercise powers that are on the borderline, it may cripple the whole democracy. Then the third area that is of concern to us is the administrative abuses by his lordship, the Chief Justice himself. Quite apart from the above, the Honorable Chief Justice, Justice Kwesi Aninyebwa, is likely to go down in history as the worst Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana since the inception of the fall. His reign as Chief Justice has been characterized by unimaginable administrative abuses. These abuses are thrown into sharp relief when the conduct of the current Chief Justice is measured against the professionalism and conduct of former Chief Justices. We recall, in particular, the words of Chief Justice Abalu at his send-off party that, and I beg to quote, the one great quality I would wish to see in my colleagues is courage. That is to say, they should be in a position to defend to the death positions they believe to be right. I charge you to keep or help keep the flag of the judiciary flying and may the profession as a whole provide leadership and best counsel on these professional matters which we have all held in trust for the benefit of generations yet unborn." Unquote. It appears that this wise counsel of Chief Justice Apalu has no resonance with our current Chief Justice, who has failed to show leadership and to keep the flag of the judiciary flying by abusing his powers to empanel the courts. It has been our understanding that the setting up of divisions of the High Court in Accra, such as the Criminal Division, Lands Division, the Human Rights Division, and the Commercial Division, were all meant to ensure that these specialized courts deal with matters that directly fall within their competence and jurisdictions. In fact, this course started very beautifully, and many were those who hailed the establishment of the court of the courts. Incidentally, in recent times, these beautiful arrangements appear to have been thrown into a state of utter confusion, where we could now witness even land cases being sent to commercial courts, clear cut commercial court cases being sent to human rights courts, and criminal cases sent to the judges at the Lands Division. <laughs> Sometimes, the assignment of cases to particular judges is done in a manner that makes one wonder what is the motivation for the case assignment. Recently, the case involving Dr. Kesaya Tufosen was originally assigned to Justice Solomon Opon Chumasi 
only for the judge to announce in open court that the chief justice had reassigned the case to another judge in another division of the high court. This development is quite mind-boggling, and we wonder why, for us in Ghana, we start everything so much aplomb and fanfare, only for us to ruin it along the way. Another worrying phenomenon is the appointment of court of appeal judges to preside over high court cases. For us, these appointments are a damper and go a long way to demotivate our judges at the high courts. By these appointments, is the Chief Justice saying that the same cases could not have been, could not have any competent justice of the High Court as currently constituted today with them, or it is more the case that the Chief Justice has a cadet of justices who are specially deployed to do the bidding of his political masters. Without missing words, we state that we see the appointment of Court of Appeal Justices to preside over these cases as worrying, to say the least. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the NDC is saddened by and gravely concerned about the phenomenon of unreasoned judgments lack of fidelity to the record of cases, unpardonable factual errors that have become commonplace in judgments of the apex court, as well as glaring administrative abuses by his lordship, the Chief Justice. We are particularly shocked by the palpable blindness committed by the apex court in the election petition judgment. In a case of such magnitude, we expected excellence, professionalism, attention to detail, and meticulousness from our Supreme Court. Indeed, what the people of Ghana obtained from the court were these unpardonable blunders which have the potential to affect people's confidence in the administrative administration of justice in our dear country. We therefore call on the Judicial Council to institute an internal inquiry to ascertain the reasons for these blunders and appropriate recommendations made to His Lordship, the Chief Justice, to forestall their recurrence until appropriate legislation such as a Judicial Proceedings Bill is passed by Parliament to regulate the writing of judgments by our courts. The NDC will also petition Parliament for the Judicial Committee of the House to conduct a public inquiry into the reasons for these blunders committed by the Supreme Court in the 2020 presidential election petition and other cases with a view to proposing appropriate remedial legislation. As I have said, the Constitution allowed some discretion to the Chief Justice to be able to do a paneling and how to handle cases and so on. But if that power is found to be abused. Parliament has every right to pass a law actually regulating how and paneling will be done. And once Parliament passes it, the courts will comply. It would have been better off without it. 
when we could rely on the exercise of appropriate and guided uh, jurisdiction over this matter, discretion over this matter by the Chief Justice. But if it is found to be subjected to abuse, then it is the duty of the Parliament and the public of Ghana to enter there, even if they will be seen to be entering the areas reserved by the judiciary. The NDC remains committed to Ghana's democracy and the promotion of the rule of law. Accordingly, we shall endeavor at all times, in line with our social democratic ethos, to ensure that the justice system performs the rule assigned to it by the 1992 Constitution, by serving the interests of all Ghanaians devoid of any political or partisan considerations. And I have said on several platforms, and I will want to repeat it here, that the very tools that are designed to build democracy, if those tools land in wrong hands, they are the same tools that are used to assassinate democracy. And that one of such tools is the judiciary. Because you cannot have a well-functioning democracy when the judiciary fails or is perceived to be failing in its duty to deliver fair administration of justice. In fact, in many, many areas, in many countries, where autocrats slip through the net and become elected as democratic presidents, it is the strong and courageous judiciary that helps to save such democracies in times when the executive have fallen into the hands of an autocrat. So when you have a system where the judiciary appears to be in the corner of the executive, and that executive is exercising tendencies of dictatorship and autocracy, then that democracy is headed for trouble. That is why I keep saying that the tools that are used to build democracy, if they fall in the hands of wrong persons, they are the very tools that are used to assassinate democracy. Fair and professional media is very useful in every democracy. But if it falls under the control of a dictator, then the media can be the most dangerous tool in assassinating democracy. Because if A is said somewhere, it is repeated somewhere by the media as it said. And that is very dangerous for democracy. The same way, if you have a professional and strong security institutions, they help to build democracy because they, they, they protect the country from both internal and external aggressors. But if the power to control these institutions falls into the hands of an autocrat, 
They are the very institutions that can be used to destroy democracy. Because instead of soldiers going after the enemies of the state and, uh, from external sources, and the police going after the enemies of the state from internal sources, they turn around to see the citizens they are, intended, they are, they are supposed to protect as the enemies of the state. And then they will be deployed to be attacking, harassing, and killing the very people they are supposed to protect. That's why we say that it is not about the existence of democratic structures. It's about the people who control those structures. Their decision whether to use the structures to build upon a democracy or to use the structures to assassinate democracy will determine whether that democracy will survive or be assassinated. Thank you very much and may God bless you.